Imagine you had to generate your own electricity. To generate one kilowatt hour, you would have to work pretty hard for about 10 hours. Based on current wages, this amounts to 80 to 300 euros per kilowatt hour. But, well, luckily, you don't have to do that. We've got technology, and our current mix of renewables, fossil fuels, and, um, and nuclear fuels brings down the price for the kilowatt hour to 30 cents. With this cheap energy, you can do a lot of things. It brings you a lot of freedom. The freedom to warm a lecture room, the freedom to watch a TEDx talk on your computer, the freedom to run the intensive care unit at a hospital. But technologies don't come without side effects. Think of Fukushima, think of global warming, think of floodings due to hydroelectricity. We need to know how to balance the pros and cons of technologies. Unfortunately, there's a whole discipline devoted to balancing pros and cons, philosophy. Philosophy can teach important skills in designing our, our technological development. Technology only provides a means to an end, a warm room, electricity to run the intensive care unit. To think about these ends, to think about the world we want to live in, to think about the world we should create with our technology. That's a normative question. But the natural and engineering sciences deal with descriptive statements about the world. This is red, this is black, this is hard, this is an electric conductor. Normative statements go beyond the realm of science and technology. They are part of humanities, particularly of philosophical thinking. Good engineering needs to reflect first on what the world it wants to create should look like. And hence, our engineering education has to change drastically, and I want to tell you why. I'm a philosopher and a physicist. Um, over the past decade, I have uh, taught engineering students in the UK, in the Netherlands, and in Germany. I've taught students from Oxford and from Stanford. And now I work as a as a professor for philosophy of science and engineering. And, well, you may think I was hired to do exactly that, to teach philosophy to engineers, to teach them how to reason about how the world should be like. But in all classes I have taught so far, I make the same experience. The reason why the students listen to me is not because philosophy may have something important to tell to them, but they listen to me because I'm a physicist, something they perceive as hard science. But philosophy has something very important to teach engineers. Technology can do wonderful things, but the side effects are often unpredicted and sometimes even unpredictable. Before the market release of CFCs, the ozone depleting effect was not anticipated. Now, after the global ban of CFCs in the 1990s, CFCs were replaced by other agents, which are quite often very strong greenhouse gases, sometimes 1,300 times stronger than CO2. Technology is used to solve technological problems only to cause new problems. What was forgotten here in this whole process was the bigger picture, namely, why do we actually care about the ozone layer? And the reason why we care about the ozone layer is just the very same reason as we do care about the climate system. Namely, it provides the basis of life on Earth for, for us living today, just as the same as for future generations. A philosophical perspective can help you see the bigger picture. Research on GMO is suggested as a solution to world hunger. And certainly, drought resistance in corn plants, for example, is a very welcome feature. But GMOs come with serious side effects, and these cannot be restricted due to pollen spread, due to wind, due to bees. And even worse, world hunger today is not a production problem. We have the means today to feed the ever-growing world population. Just the food is not distributed in unfair an equal way. 
And the distribution problem, the actual source of world hunger today, certainly won't be solved by GMOs. But technology could do so much good here. You may think that the way we treat farm animals these days is completely unacceptable. More and more people go vegan. But until now, an all-vegan farming is still not possible. We still need technological advances, for example, in the form of fertilizers, in order to do completely without all farm animals. But is this the future you want to realize? All vegan farming, or is this just some preference of some weirdos in some affluent Western societies? How can we actually distinguish individual preferences, individual interests from more universal goals? Everybody seems to have their own technotopia. For the one, it is vegan farming. For the other, it would be flying cars. But when we talk about technologies such as GMOs or energy technologies, the decision for or against one technology affects us all, affects people living now and affects people living in the future. So, is there a rational way to talk about the future we want to live in? A common answer here is, a very hasty answer is no. And at first glance, this hasty answer seems to be supported by local opposition, like the one against a local wind farm, which you see here in the picture. People, so the assumption, maybe in general probe wind energy, but please, they are not willing to accept the disadvantages they get from a wind farm in their own close neighborhood. This is the so-called NIMBY effect, or NIMBY phenomenon, not in my backyard. I may be pro-renewable energies, but please, not in my own vicinity, not in my neighborhood, not in my backyard. This indeed would make a rational discourse on the technological future we want to realize impossible. And that is what many engineers believe. While you can talk rationally about the scientific features of the world and the technological features of the world, there is no common ground to talk about values. For decades, the NIMBY phenomenon has been cited, mantra-like, as an explanation for local opposition. But social science research since the 2000s shows very clearly that the assumptions underlying the NIMBY explanation are plainly false. People do not only articulate egoistic interests, rather they articulate valid critique of the decision-making process. For example, that the decision-making process was not fair enough or not transparent enough. Hence, the NIMBY explanation is not only oversimplifying, it is plainly wrong and does not take the public seriously. So, this at least gives some hope that a rational discourse on the technological future we all as humans should realize is possible. But of course, people do articulate egoistic preferences. And that's a good right. It's just that well, not all interests, not all preferences have to be given the same weight in decision-making. My wish to fuel a second car is probably not as important as future generations' interest in an intact environment. And this, in turn, may not be as important as present generations' need for safe and reliable energy supply in order to run a local hospital. We need to distinguish between interests and preferences and values. While interests may very well differ from one person to another, values express more stable convictions that people feel should be strived for in general and not only for themselves. When you look at technology assessment today, it is mainly about taking into account the interests of all relevant stakeholders. If this works, it gives you something you can call technology acceptance. But we all know very well from our German history that what the majority of people may want may very well not be ethically justifiable. So instead of technology acceptance, we want to go for technology acceptability. 
a technology that can in principle be accepted by all the technology impacts upon future generations just the same as we today. Now, to derive the relevant skill values from the articulated interests requires skill and requires knowledge. Skills that can be trained, a knowledge about normative theories that philosophical and particular ethical theory can provide. Now, focusing on values instead of preferences is a first step in the direction of designing the world we want to live in with the technology we have at hand. And this implies a fundamental turn in engineering and societal practice away from what we can do to what we should do. Not everything that is technically feasible is sound to realize. Take climate engineering. Climate engineering is any deliberate intervention into the climate system. Today, usually, with the aim to counterbalance global warming. This can be anything, starting from forestation to more severe impacts, like deliberately in injecting sulfur aerosols into the atmosphere with the aim to cool the atmosphere. You can think of this as a kind of artificial volcano explosion. Now, to propagate climate engineering as the solution to global warming seems again to put the cart before the horse. It is our inability to understand the climate system in all its details in the first place that has caused the problem of global warming. And this is an inability that has nothing to do with immature or bad science. It simply has to do with the nature of the climate system itself. We simply cannot expect from climate models the same accuracy and reliable predictions as we can from Newton's theory of gravitation. Now, falling back on climate engineering as the technocratic solution to global warming is a form of hubris. It ignores not only that there may be many more solutions out there to the problem of global warming, think of low-tech ones, like reducing emissions in the first place, much worse, it completely ignores our principal limitations of our knowledge, which were the origins of the problem in the first place. In the end, it will be only our future engineers who can view prospects and risks of emerging and disruptive technologies. Technology alone won't solve the grand challenges we face today. Hence, we need to change the educational curriculum of our engineering students. Technology can only provide the means to reach certain goals, but these goals need to be found elsewhere. Science and technology won't help us here. Well, and actually, engineers are used to including non-technical and also non-scientific reasoning into their work. Economic reasoning almost always bounds and restricts engineering progress these days. But shaping our world through engineering cannot be bound by economic rationality alone. It cannot be bound only by thinking about cost effectiveness and market success. We need to include more normative reasoning. We need to think first about the world we want to live in before we use technology and all its great potential in order to create it. Thank you.